Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is John Roberti and today's topic is, why does it matter? Understanding big data and antitrust. We have heard a lot in the news about big data and why it's important and why maybe there should even be more enforcement. And and frankly, there's there hasn't been a lot of detail behind it. So today we're going to learn a little bit more about what really is some of the issues. What does big data mean and why does it matter? My co-host is Sergey Zulinski. Hi, Sergey. Hi, John. How are you? Good, good. So, Sergey, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about big data. It's a term everybody throws around. I suspect fewer people actually really have thought through what it means than the number of people using the term. So I figured it would be good to have somebody really smart, somebody who really knows the topic on our program, uh, explain what it means and talk about, does it matter in antitrust analysis and why? And why is this important? Well, we now generate more data than we ever have in history. And I think that trend is just going to continue going further in that direction. Internet of Things is becoming uh, more and more of a real uh, thing in our lives. And we are going to be generating more and more data. And it matters in many different disciplines. And I think it's natural to ask, does it matter in the antitrust? And what do we hope to get out of the program today? Uh, a, I think we want to learn and get a better understanding what big data actually is. Uh, B, you want to figure out, does it matter for antitrust analysis and why? Who's our guest? Uh, we're very lucky to have Danny Sokol, who is a true thought leader in big data and a great many other topics in antitrust policy. Uh, Danny is both an academic and a practitioner, uh, giving him a truly unique perspective. Uh, he is a law professor at the University of Florida Levin College of Law and a senior advisor at the White and Case Law Firm and an all-around nice guy. Well, good. Let's bring in our guest, Professor Sokol. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the program. Danny, the professor title, y- you have to pay tuition to be able to use that. <laughs> well, keep that in mind, Danny. Danny, so let's start off real be- basic. What makes something big data? I know what data is. I know what the word big means, but you know the term big data, what makes something big data? So... In many ways, we've seen this before, it's just bigger now. Uh, And there are traditionally four different areas in which we see data being bigger. Number one, the volume. And I think you've already touched upon that. We just simply have more of it. Uh, We have so many different things generating uh, data. So um, how do we generate data? There's vast amounts of data from unstructured data sources. So part, some data structured, some data is unstructured. So if you've watched a Woody Allen movie, some Jews have horns, some Jews have stripes. Um, you know, you can get it from sensors, tags, trackers, smart devices, um, collecting data in real time and variety of businesses. We have internet data, online reviews, social media, digital quick streams, cameras, um, uh, surveillance footage, should we be going in that direction? Uh, Environmental data. Is it raining today in Florida or Washington, D.C.? We also have the velocity. We're just getting the data so much faster now than before. And what you've just seen is uh, V number three, variety. Look at all the different data sources that I'm talking about. And then there's the fourth one, veracity. Um, Maybe we don't hear so much about veracity in the political context as much as we used to, but in in data that that still matters. Um, So it's this amalgamation, one might say, of all of these different factors together that makes data big and as with anything else in technological change. Big is scary in general, right? We always have a big bad wolf. We don't have the tiny little wolf. also, technology is scary. So if we think of the origins of the science fiction genre, 
although science fiction and you know fantasy have sort of existed for a long time, the modern origin is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, in the 1800s. And this is the first one that somehow technology overtakes our world and sort of destroys the world that we know it. You see a lot more of the traditional science fiction emerge uh, during in industrial revolutionary uh, at times. Uh, you know, H.G. Wells, I think probably the best known science fiction writer of that uh, era. Today, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And, you know, big data is that new big scary thing because it's dislocating a lot of people. Technology scary. The use of technology scary. And where we've seen big data used before, it was called Skynet. And somehow uh, in one through five iterations of the Terminator movies, the machines took over. And that, that was kind of scary. Why do antitrust commentators in particular seem to be so concerned about this new Frankenstein? Uh, what's the connection to antitrust? So, in part, antitrust responds to changes in technology, we, where we take old theories uh, of harm and we apply it to a new set of facts. So whenever we have new facts, it's exciting. We're like, oh, what's the theory that we can connect to facts? Um, and here's the, here's the overall problem. Um, most antitrust lawyers and economists don't actually understand the technology. In fact, the only technology that they understand is from watching Big Bang Theory episodes. So first you have to start with understanding the technology. Then you have to actually understand the economics. And does the economics match up with the technology? A lot of times our economists haven't really thought about some of the unique challenges in some markets uh, that are highly innovative. And the traditional models that they use may need to be tweaked um, in order to do that. Does economics still play a role? Absolutely. But it has to understand and be nuanced with regard to the technology. Then we get to the lawyers. you know. And so when we get to the lawyers, the lawyers have to match up the underlying technology, the economic evidence, and apply a set of you know legal theories to it to figure out do we have a case and so lawyers get excited whenever anything is new a because there's potential for liability in any number of ways but lawyers need to dig deeper i think in terms of understanding uh technology lawyers i think have gotten better in the last 30 years in understanding the economics but we still have that disconnect let me play it slightly differently so in Engineering school, what do you learn? How to get from point A to point B to point C, right? You, you try to understand processes and try to optimize those processes. In business schools, you just focus on point C and say, how do you monetize that? And the lawyers, they simply say, is there any case law involving point C? And we have to get past that. And so this is the problem with big data. We just kind of hear that's exciting, but we don't understand this process. We don't understand how do you monetize it. And we also, therefore, don't understand sort of that we need to think more there. Is there any case law in point C? So, so isn't it isn't it the case that um, the law tends to lag technology by a number of years? I mean, it, it's just a matter of there's nothing and then the technology comes and then you have to kind of figure out what it means. And then by the time the law is developed, the technology has changed and it's not really – applicable anymore. How do you deal with that problem, if it is a problem? So I think this is an endemic problem. John, you're absolutely right. This is an endemic problem in every area of law that is dealing with technological change. We're always playing catch up. But what is law really good at? It's about making comparisons. This case looks more like case A rather than case B. And law is really about telling a story where we're telling a story by analogy. Um, so if you recall the Microsoft case, the linchpin for that case was actually not at all a traditional technology case. It was a case about newspapers, right? Lorraine Journal. And similarly, uh, whether it's economic analysis, because if we recall in 1998, probably the best book written about the economics of technology was written by Hal Varian and Carl Shapiro, Information Rules. And their basic point is similar to the one that you made, which is that technology is constantly changing, but there's a lot of core principles in economics that can be applied to new settings. 
And I think law works in much the same way. We're always playing catch up, but we're able to do so oftentimes with the existing tool set, sometimes with some tweaks because things have changed. So talking about applying existing tools to new challenges, uh, some of the economic or legal concepts a lot of people think apply to big data is uh, network effects. Can you talk about network effects and why that's a relevant thing to think about if you're thinking about big data? Absolutely. So first of all, let's start with the study of networks effects. You know, for many people, they're just like, oh, that's Roche and Tirol, early 2000s. It, now we call it, you, you know, um, platforms. When they were writing about it, we called it two-sided markets. In the 90s, we called it intermediaries. In the 80s, we called it um, network effects. But in fact, the understanding of network effects in the economics literature goes to early uh, to the early part of the 1900s. Uh, someone who was a member of the Austrian School of Economics and indeed finance minister of Austria, though at this point is best known as Schumpeter's PhD advisor, was Eugen Bohm von Barn, who actually wrote a book in the 20s that focused on something that he called at the time two-sided markets. And again, I only read it in translation, no German here. Um, at least it's been three generations since someone has spoken German in the family. Um, and it turns out he was describing exactly the same kind of economic effects. This is not new. And in fact, have either of you ever watched Fiddler on the Roof? Of course. Right. I've not actually. My wife makes fun of me. I've never seen it. As no. a Russian Jew, that's embarrassing to admit. <laughs> yes, that's. That, that's so, so from, so, so I've got to say that that's, that's really bad. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's yen to the matchmaker. Well, we've had matchmakers, whether it's in like some little Jewish village in the pale of settlement or, you know, the ancient agora of Rome. Um, we've had matchmakers, um, you know, whether for, for economic purposes or social purposes or a little bit of mix of both. Remember Mulan and the matchmaker there? Uh, uh, you uh, watch Mulan, right? I, I have a daughter. Yes, uh, watch Mulan. No, 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 no. Whether or not, so, so this is, so I have three daughters. I watched Mulan long before they were born. You know, Frozen maybe wouldn't have watched it a hundred times, but for the fact that I had a four-year-old that would wake up every day, can I watch Frozen again? Yeah, that, but that, that movie almost that movie almost ruined America. Frozen. Yeah. It, we it, don't need big, big data analytics to walk through that one. But uh, I'll, I'll agree uh, because there's nothing worse than being belted at 4.30 in the morning by a, by a four-year-old that just got up, you know, let it go. And yeah. I'm like, no, no, let me sleep. Yeah. Um, but the larger point is we've had network economics and network effects for a long time. Um, and so this goes, I guess, to the question of data, right? So one idea in the network effects is the, it's only as valuable – the network is only as valuable the more people you have on the network. This is your traditional direct network effects. So I, the theory then becomes like, aha, because we have a platform that has strong network effects and they have data, they can do things that other people can't do with that. Um, and so there's positives and negatives we can imagine to that. So the positive story is written by one of my co-authors, Anthony Dukes, a paper that right now has been sitting around um, and uh, – you know, that he first wrote in 2016 that's making its way through uh, revise and resubmit in, in, a, in a journal. Um, and the idea, he says, is like, yeah, you have a company that has network effects, that has a lot of data, but you can do a lot more with the data by having more of it. Um, and on the other side, the concern is, well, wait a second, you have a lot of data, we might have some exclusionary behavior or if you're German, you might say there might be some exploitative abuse uh, to that data. But let's just stick with the traditional non-German story because we don't have the English subtitles to go with the German uh, text. But you know, given that we don't have any theme music, it's kind of German new wave cinema and we could all be Werner Herzog. Um, but what I would say is part of this is also understanding there's data and then there's what we do with the data. And I think that these are distinct things, right? A lot of data is non-rivalrous. And I talked about all the different 
types of data we have, maybe it's worth talking for a moment about the different ways of getting data. We can get it ourselves. Uh, we might have data suppliers um, where other people are providing us data in terms of data resellers. We have data managers that catalog and clean um, and parse information that can be released in a usable format. Um, we have within the data ecosystem, our service providers, our data custodians, our app developers, our platforms, our data aggregators. So this typically means data is non-rivalries. We can get it from many different ways. That's part number one. This is to, this is gets to, are we concerned about the network effects? Um, part number two is it's not the data, it's what you do with it. So there are plenty of companies that have great data, but really don't use it effectively. And without mentioning companies by name, let me draw an analogy in a different way. Some companies have a lot of cash. Some people have a lot of cash. What you do with the cash matters. Do you spend it on more R&D? Do you go have an acquisition? Do you send it back to your shareholders in terms of dividend? What you do with the data matters much the same way what you do with the cash matters. For you, know, for you guys, like you've got 50 grand and you think, is it worth redoing you know, the, you know, the bathroom? There are plenty of different ways that you can really screw up what you do with the bathroom, right? You, you just have a bad vision. It turns out that you know, uh, quartz is now out or, or something like that. You're like, you've got to go with the slate. And data works in much the same way. We have to think about it as it is an asset of sorts in that much like with anything else that a company has, it's what you do with it that matters. So talk about um, the different things companies could do with data and what are the potential antitrust concerns with different use cases for data? Sure. So let's think about all the things that they could do, right? We could imagine a world where with better data analytics, we can reduce their search time because we have a better sense of what they want. Think of any number of companies that are looking to sell something directly to end consumers, because I think this is where people get particularly concerned about their data, right? Um, so you could imagine a world where um, I, you know, am getting all kinds of pop-up ads that show up for tampons, not really useful for, for my day-to-day -day life. Um, but if they're able to hone in on those things that I actually purchase on a regular basis um, for myself, then all of a sudden, it's both more useful, but we could imagine I might be getting competitive advantage, the company might be getting competitive advantage of steering certain products based on that knowledge, uh, either based on what I purchase or how much attention I have for a particular I, uh, you know, idea. So we, we, if we take the traditional ideas of exclusion, you know, one might be that I have the data that other people don't have, um, that I can exclude competitors that way who don't have as much data as I do. Well, it sounds like you developed an asset. You use that asset to build a better business. What's the problem? Do you think there is a problem there or do you think that concern right. is so overblown? Now you've actually linked two issues together. One is the data and the other is what you do with it. So what we do with it is oftentimes our algorithm. The data is only as good as the algorithm that, or, or algorithms, uh, which we're also constantly tweaking. Uh, and again, we, we tend to focus on uh, and company uh, and consumer company type platforms um, or, or apps. But in fact, we can think across the entire supply chain, um, the, you know, whether it's business to business or business to, con to end consumer, the, these kinds of issues are going to emerge. And the question is, you're only as good as the algorithm. So what does an algorithm need to be effective? Now to com complicate things even more, Depending on the jurisdiction we're in, the algorithm itself and the data used in the algorithm may have IP protections. Uh, so in addition to a data question, now we have an IP question to go with it. Then there's the question of like, well, can we interconnect, um, you know, uh, or can we port data? All of these issues come up and then we have antitrust doctrines that go to some of these questions, right? Do we have a duty to deal? Um, what if we have a refusal of that duty to deal? Do essential facilities somehow play in? Is every platform nothing other than a giant public utility? 
So it sounds like there's a lot going on with data and, and antitrust in your no, view. No, no, it's, it's big. It's big. And it's happening really fast. Velocity, you know, right. The third V, I believe. Yes. So if you could just kind of bottom line it for us, in your view, three most important antitrust concerns or topics relating to big data. What Number three one. things should an antitrust practitioner know? So what does an antitrust need, practitioner need to know? Three things. Number one, what do you do with the data? Number two, is the data non-rivalrous? Number three, does using of the big data match a traditional theory of harm for antitrust that we should have significant concern over? Um, because we've seen this, uh, it's kind of like how every movie gets redone. We've seen data play out uh, before, and now we're just seeing uh, you know, a reboot version. So we've had a series of cases involving mergers where big data comes up. Um, we've had cases involving just regular data, but we could imagine the same kind of concern happening with big data. We You'd think the same kind of thing in a conduct um, situation. Do you think the concern with big data is a little overdone, overhyped in the antitrust world, or do you think there's really something there that uh, antitrust practitioners, academics, agencies need to take a look at and develop our understanding further to make sure that uh, we are applying these old theories correctly to the new technology and the new challenges we're facing? So overall, I'd say both practitioners and academics have a very narrow view of how to look at data. A lot of the interesting work involving big data is actually not coming from economics. We get a lot of really great theory from economics. Most of the empirical work is being done in marketing. It's being done in operations management. It's being done in strategy. It's being done in information systems. And with the rise of FinTech, it's being done in finance departments. None of these are traditional places where I think academics or practitioners tend to look. And if you look at who um, spoke, for example, at the FTC hearings on the competition side, it was very rare to have somebody in one of these other fields speak. If you look at citations to what appears in the antitrust law journal, very rarely do we look at these journals. That's a problem. What we would learn from these journals is, in fact, I think, we do have some issues that are more real than others. So the, the basic question goes to how much rival, how, how much rivalry do we have with regards to data, right? Is this in fact a unique asset or does the uh, amalgamation of data create its own set of problems? It turns out that, you know, once you reach a certain point, you don't need that much more data and data has a short shelf life in many cases. But there actually are some areas that I think have been overlooked where you might actually have some real competition problems. And this is upstream, where in fact we tend not to have a lot of rivalry. So think about um, not the Internet of Things with my talking toaster, speaking to my talking refrigerator, speaking uh, you know, to my television and telephone. Um, think instead about like heavy machinery used in Internet of Things for industrial tools. Think about a lot of unique data that you might get in ag tech um, with regards to you, you know, particular seeds in particular parts of the country. Um, think about um, like, let's say a Fortune 500 race car that has over 3000 sensors on it uh, that's producing a lot of data, but we can't really replicate that data very easily the way we can and consumer data. This, each of these, I should say, are areas we really haven't spent time thinking about in the antitrust context, where the idea of non-rivalrous data... If I can just interrupt you for a second, uh, for those in our audience who are not uh, as into economics as you are, could you just briefly explain different difference between rivalrous and non-rivalrous and why it matters for data? Sure. So it just means, is it mine and only mine? Or is it sort of all over, kind of like the force, right? It touches upon everything and, and no one person has it. Kind of like love for my children, it's endless. But that doesn't mean that I can't love other people like the two of you, um, non-rivalrous. Although, let's be clear, 
kids always assume that you're picking one over the other. Um, always when somehow one of the others gets a slightly larger cookie than they do. Um, but, but the idea of exclusivity, that's what makes something rivalrous. Um, and do we have any kind of substitute? In some cases, we may not have that substitute. But we've also seen that in a series of cases that the agencies in the US, and indeed I'm sure in other countries have done as well, dealing with other kinds of data. So think about historic stock analysis data that we saw in a famous deal. Um, it wasn't big data, it was just traditional legacy data. Nobody else could replicate that data. We had more considerable concerns there because of the fact that others couldn't replicate it. That's the problem, right? We can replicate the, the T2000 or whatever, Terminator we're on today, but we can't replicate you because you're special. Yet, Dolly the sheep being the only thing so far that we've been able to replicate. Just, just want to confirm, I don't believe the Terminator has arrived yet, um, but I'm... Opinions may vary on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and why does it matter for antitrust whether our data is rivalrous or not? And you said that some data... Because this goes to exclusion. Can uh -huh. you exclude? If you have something that nobody else has, you can exclude. Sort of like earlier in my life where I would see that there was a velvet rope with a bouncer with a big poofy black jacket and he wouldn't let me in no matter how much I tried to pay him uh, to get into a club. And but enough about my insecurities. Let's go back to antitrust. And now I assume that that's not a problem and you do get into all the clubs. Um but I live in a college town. There isn't somebody that I somehow don't know or that my wife doesn't recognize for her, from her Zumba class. So, um, and along the lines of what Sergey asked, we talked about network effects, and I think a lot of people know what those are, but tell me if I'm wrong. Network effects means that the, there's a benefit from having more participation, right? Yes. So, and, but, but there is a potential downside for network effects. And this is why oftentimes we're in a rule of reason type situation. When do the positives of network effects outweigh the negatives of network um, effects? So think about because you have the network, you can exclude people from being part of the network, particularly if their business model is not the same as your business model. Um, you can shut them out by simply not through the kind of rigorous competition um, that the Supreme Court says under Trinko we'd like to have that you could, uh, but through an anti-competitive way that we're using the network effects to somehow exclude uh, based on based on a theory of harm. Well, I think this is this has been very helpful. I think we probably now are going to shift uh, to just a slightly different topic, and we want to ask uh, Danny. We want to ask you just a couple of, a couple of slightly different questions. First one is: um, Do you have any advice for anybody who would want to want to be a law professor? Any suggestions? Law professor. Um, so here, here's what I'd say. You have to stop thinking like, a, in, in many ways, your fundamental mindset has to change. You have to say, it doesn't matter what my client, whether it's the government or uh, a law firm client, um, says, I only need an answer up until this point. You have to say, I want to push farther than that. I want to really dig deep until I'm satisfied with the answer. Then you have to deal with a bunch of people who are eccentric because uh, in a law context, most of the work that you do is by yourself. So it's a monastic style of life where you get out to like, instead of pray, you go out and you teach. Um, occasionally you have meals with your, with your colleagues, but it's maybe there's a vow of silence because you don't really talk to them much when you eat. Uh, and then you go back and you just sit and you just crank out more reading and, and, and writing. You have to really want to live in that lifestyle. You have to want to teach and you have to want to write. And try to say, I want to push the needle forward. I want, I don't like the way how we frame an issue. I want to re-theorize a particular antitrust doctrine, or I want to re-theorize sort of broader things. I'm going to connect things that we hadn't thought before, like antitrust and privacy, antitrust and IP, antitrust and corporate governance. Um, and then you just 
there, there seems to be a, a, it's become much more institutionalized now than in prior generations. There are a series of programs you need to basically have a postdoc in order to have the time to write. And then you go on the market and then you hope that you match up with the school. So what's, what's, uh, it sounds like you have fun doing it. What's the most fun part of it? The students. Best job in the world because every year it's people with new and interesting ideas, many of whom actually want to learn, some of whom feel that they have to take your class. But the rest of them, they're there because they want to learn and you feed off of that excitement. And they come up and sometimes if they ask a really basic question, it makes you rethink the assumptions behind it. Well, why, why do we think about it that way? It's kind of like that client who's not an antitrust practitioner who asks the basic question, why do we define markets? And you say, There's the outsiders oh, the that have the best ideas. People who are just a little bit to the outside of a particular field see things f- from a fresh view. And a lot of times I uh, kind of have that kernel of inspiration that people who are in the field day in, day out don't get. What's the best example of that? What's the best idea that you got from something a student said who didn't know antitrust that well, maybe, but it's just some kernel there struck you and it developed into uh, an important insight? I think one of my favorite student comments um, ever that really got me thinking about an issue, and it's a a work stream that I'm in now, this was a student, a graduate student in, who's a, at this point, they're a professor at some institution, but they were a young PhD student in marketing, specifically in IO marketing. And they asked the basic question, why is it that in marketing, we view competition markets this way, whereas antitrust, you view markets somewhat differently? And I pondered long and hard about different terminologies and just sort of different ways of thinking about things. And that led to a research stream that I have now that, that that's more the interface of antitrust and marketing, trying to understand in particular, um, how do vertical restraints really work in practice? Um, and, and how do we measure the impact of antitrust law on these vertical restraints? All right, last question before we get to our last segment. Danny, tell us something that is unusual or unexpected about yourself that we wouldn't know if we only knew you professionally. The last time I put my foot down in my marriage is when I broke the glass at the end of the ceremony. And with that, (laughs) it's now time for our final segment, which is The Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. Okay, Danny, on this program, we have a tradition, the curious hat, where either the guest of the guest is live in studio or the host select a question from a hat. And it's a fun, random question. And you're lucky enough to get this one. Which famous living or dead person would you want to meet and why? Don Rickles. And why? why? So it turns out there are many things he did that you, you can't get away with today. Very offensive. Um, but what he was able to do is in any given crowd, he was able to take anybody's personal story and find a way to somehow make it relevant to everybody else. For those people who are economists or lawyers, this really, I think, speaks to their ability to basically take a story that's is unique and to make it more generalizable. Uh, and I think that is a real skill. And, and with that, we want to thank you for being on our program. This brings us to the end of this episode. We will see you next time on Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. 
The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the antitrust section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.org. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.